That's what I call marketing live volume two with Professor Karen Nelson Field. Special thanks to Heineken Ireland for hosting this live event. Today's show is supported by the Indie List, the leader in providing you with easy access to hundreds of highly experienced marketers quickly and cost effectively. Visit the IndieList.ie to speak to the Indie List team today. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities. Um, welcome to That's What I Call Marketing, the podcast where you will hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. Today is That's What I Call Marketing Live Volume 2 and we are here in the offices of Heineken Ireland and thanks to Heineken Ireland for hosting this, Fiona Curtin, uh, Liz Hegarty and all the team here at Heineken who have put everything together for us this morning. Honestly, couldn't have, we couldn't have done this without you, so really, really appreciate it. Um, before we start, don't forget, wherever you are listening or watching or even here in the room today, you can like the episodes of That's What I Call Mark, and you can rate them, normally five stars or better. Uh, you can subscribe so you never miss an episode again. It really helps us build the great community of marketers that listen to the podcast. And speaking of great community of marketers, welcome to all of you who've joined us here today live at this event. Um, all the great and good of Adland are here today. So thanks for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. So on to today's guests. Um, I won't lie, I suspect you were maybe a little bit close to asking me to stop contacting you. I, <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of emails from Connor to Karen uh, saying, hey, come on the podcast. And then Karen said, actually, I'm going to be in Ireland. Let's, let's meet up then. So really, really appreciate uh, you can call off the lawyers now. <laughs> um, it's, it's probably fair to say you need no real introduction, but I'm going to do one. Okay, okay so hopefully this goes okay. Uh, so our, our stellar guest today, Professor Karen Nelson Field, a titan in the realm of marketing and media research, groundbreaking uh, work in the books of viral marketing, the science of sharing, the attention economy and how media works, and ongoing contributions through the likes of Wark and other publications, uh, even on your own website, Amplified Intelligence. Um, really has revolutionized the understanding of digital advertising effectiveness. And actually somebody messaged me on LinkedIn the other night saying they were at the, the dinner with you and it commented how their whole digital strategy has completely changed due to your work. So there's one real live example. I won't name them, but there you go. Um, your groundbreaking and innovative research into attention and engagement in digital space has challenged the existing paradigms and reshaped strategies. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Karen Nelson Field. I was going to start with the really bad gag about, you know, oh, so if people aren't paying attention, you know, explain who you are. But I think we'll just skip that if you're okay. Normally it's a bad gag. A, a, a bad gag about Australia. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, let's, can we start quickly about Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Okay. Cats and snakes, please, real quickly. This, you heard this, about that? Yes. Okay. So brown snakes is a thing in Australia. Now, bearing in mind, I've never seen one in my entire life. So it's not like if you do come to Australia, you just go, oh my God, there's a brown snake on the floor. This doesn't work by the way. But just before Christmas, I was on a Zoom call. I have this amazing cat who is just so spunky. She often brings me little rat presents. But today, <laughs> and this day, she decides to come in with a brown snake in her mouth. I'm actually not joking. And so I'm on this Zoom call. My cat's like, oh, hi. And you know, the snake's flipping around on either side. Honestly, she drops it at my feet because she thinks that will be fun. <laughs> I poo my pants, basically. Start screaming up on the chair because they can actually kill you. And she's still sitting there. It slithers off under the curtains. I grab the cat, shut the doors, ring a snake catcher. The snake catcher comes and she picks it up with her hand because she's a good Australian. <laughs> and she goes, oh, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Unfortunately, the cat got bit and that was $5,000 that night. So thanks very much. But yeah, so that's my, my brown snake effort. And this is not an ad for Tourism Australia. <laughs> 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 Cute fluffy kangaroos. Just remember, remember yeah. that. Um, well, listen, before we get into, you know, kind of the, the topic of it, attention really deeply, I'd love to talk a bit about your, your early career. Um, and I, I think I was saying to you, you know, I, I haven't really heard 
you talk about this as much. So I'm really interested in kind of how you got into where you are now. I mean, it's all over LinkedIn, you're, you know, where you, you've been. But you, you had a role as an ads manager with News Corp. You all were... good Australians have worked for News Corp in their 20s. <laughs> all good Australians. I always yeah. think it sounds like some evil corporation, but we won't get, we won't get into that. News Corp. It sounds like something out of Batman. Uh, and then a marketing manager for, uh, for Diageo. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then you work for South Australian Tourism. Tourism Commission. Yeah. yeah. Not talking about about snakes. No. Well, what got you interested in kind of pursuing some of those those roles? Uh, so, look, I've always loved marketing and advertising and I was head of multiple divisions at the Tourism Commission. Um, to be quite honest with you, I, I my passion area has always been media. So I was obviously responsible for all those media budgets and then working for News Corp through those years. Um, so when my kids were born, they're, they're Irish twins, right? So very, very fast after the other. And um, I decided to do, I was offered a scholarship to do a PhD and I said, well, I'd love to, but I want to do something in media and there's this whole thing called digital going on, so maybe I could do something in that. So I did that and I just fell into, oh my gosh, there's a massive difference between measurement from traditional media and what's happening now. What impact is that going to have down the track? And that's how I sort of got into this because I could see even in those days when there's no consistencies in measurement, it's going to cause all sorts of problems around currency. And that's exactly what where we're at. And then how, how did that work then lead you into Ehrenberg Bass? Where you, you so I, my PhD was Ehrenberg Bass. Bass. Um, and so what I learned along the way was the laws of brand growth. But what I could see quite quickly was that if not all reach was equal, the laws of brand growth would struggle to hold because they're all based on equitable impressions, right? That reach is all equal and you can actually reach base plan. So over the years, um, I, did, I did about 11 years there and then the boys were big enough for me to think about starting a business. But the cruncher for me was, and that was when I wrote my first book. So the yeah. first book was with the university. Um, but the cruncher for me was I did a big piece of work for Unilever and it was at a time when their CMO was questioning the value of viewability. Remember there was this whole thing around about 2016 where they all went, 50% pixels, really? Shouldn't it be 100? And all the big famous CMOs were questioning it. So I was lucky enough for them to fund, I was running a research agency within the university at the time and they funded a big project. And I thought, how the hell am I gonna understand whether humans are actually doing what they're saying they're doing or you know, it's relative. Um, because at the time, viewability just measures what I call inward, which is measuring time and view. It's got nothing to do with the human, which I call measuring outward. So I went, oh, how can I do that? I was introduced to computer vision before gaze tracking was famous. And I started to build some really scrappy tech and tried to get people to, basically we were filming people ethnographically while they were using Facebook. And there was this massive, oh my God, gap between viewable inventory and reality of what people were doing and I went right I'm leaving and that's what I did and I started a business and wanted to understand a little bit more and here we are. And what made you go to that you know as you said the looking outward thing you know if everyone was going this way you started going that way. Only Why? because well, what's interesting about that's an excellent question um, what's interesting about that is ethnographic research is traditionally the best way to understand human behavior so if you need, if you want to understand humans, you have to, you have to measure humans. And I could tell straight up that, you know, anything that was inward was implied human behavior. So because I was at the university, I remember these really famous studies called the Ball State University studies, which were really big in the 90s, where, um, and they were famous in the media space because for quite a few months, these these researchers basically followed these people around to sort of understand their media usage. I mean, when you think about it, it's so old fashioned, but they made, they got into all the journal articles and they were quite famous because they found all these patterns in media usage. So I remember thinking, I kind of have to follow that, but how am I going to do that at scale? I'm not going to be following people around. Oh my God, I should probably build something where I can intercept cameras film people, but also understand. So we, we built technology that could intercept with their permission, you know, your use of TikTok and your use of Facebook and your use of web and with permission. So I had both, I had inward, because we were tracking the same stuff as all the viewability yeah. businesses were, and outward, because we were filming people. And that's where, you know, here we are seven years later. 
Can I take you back a little bit, because I want to get into the, the setting up of Amplify, but in 2012, you presented some work in, in New York uh, <laughs> at the time, and it, it, what you called it disentangled one of Facebook's core engagement metrics at the time, people talking about this, um, and it challenged the core of the very the advertising model at a very sensitive time for Facebook. Very sensitive. They still hate my guts. Do they? Yeah. Guts is an Australian word. Um. <laughs> so you can tell me a bit about that, that moment and what, yeah. So it's funny. Um, so I remember, you know, obviously doing a PhD at Ehrenberg Bass taught me that it's penetration over loyalty, right? And yet in the early days before Facebook was IPO'd, Remember when likes is what you, it was a currency unto itself, like likes was a currency and you know, Unilever had God knows how many, yeah. 10 million or whatever likes, probably more than that and it was quite a community and a currency and if you, if you get likes then you, know, you have the lion's yeah. share. And I went, I don't, I don't know that I believe that because theoretically that's a loyalty metric, right? So is this real? So unbeknownst to Port Facebook, <laughs> um, for two years prior to that, because I was still at the university, so I engaged a research team for me and we followed, because at the time, Facebook had this measure that, I don't know if any of you remember this, that was on the front of Facebook page and it was constantly clicking over and it was called people talking about this. So every time a share would happen or a like would happen, this little counter would go and you go, oh my God, this is so cool. So I was able to, for two years, follow this little counter for 200 top brands and work out where all of those little numbers went. I know, nerd. <laughs> and anyway, so then I got all this information. I'm like, oh my God. So less than, and, and the, the research was that in any given week, less than 1% of your, the people that like you even bother with you ever again, kind of equivalent. Yeah. And it was so striking. And it, was, it, it, taught, it, it made sense because loyalty is not a thing. So the reason why it was timely, and, or untimely for them, was I was invited to the ARF, which is every March. I'm there this year again. And in New York, and I presented this work paper, this research paper, which, and I was a bit lamb to slaughter because I didn't realize the S storm, let's call it a shit storm, it would, it would create because it was during their IPO period. So if anyone knows anything about IPO periods, they have a quiet period where they're not allowed to respond to any kind of criticism. And I just happened to, <laughs> I didn't mean to, presented to 3,000 people and said, their whole economic model's bullshit because <laughs> it's based on this process of liking and it doesn't work. Well, it went viral. <laughs> so for about a year, the people at the university had to stop, like they had to screen people from trying to contact me on it because it was absolutely massive. So there's my history. Yeah. And that was the first time I de demystified a, um, a, a myth, I guess. Pretty big one. It was a big one. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I, and it was, like, I was curious, you just really touched on it there a bit, but you know, because you said the battle lines were drawn, oh, yeah. which I can understand. Um, a lot of upset people. I guess you haven't been to Zuckerberg's house yet. Look, they've actually, to be fair to them, um, you know, the first few years of the attention economy, they were not very happy with me yeah. either. Um, because, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen my work around two and a half seconds, which is like an, 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 an sort of a attention memory threshold thing. They don't like that. Yeah. But we've since worked with them, particularly in Asia Pack and things like that. So they've kind of come around to the fact that it's, it's, um, it's an important measure. So... Okay. There's pockets of love. There's pockets of love. Did you feel protected then by the university at that time? Like, like you say, because the bat lines were drawn, people were out to get you. You know, this is your first big piece. Oh, I have to say, if I was in business at that time, I think I would have struggled to continue because it was pretty hairy. The, the you know, they had a lot of supporters. I mean, Comscore got involved and, like, you know, the, people were backing Facebook. Right. So, you know, it was good that I was sheltered at a period when I wasn't trying to earn money on my own. So yeah. by the time I left the university and we were trying to build a business, I'd already had sort of a profile and, you know, I did extra work from that point around viewability. And so, so yeah, it, I think it was a good time for me to... to 
put the knife in. <laughs> <laughs> Unintentionally. Oh, yeah. uh, how do you reflect on your time at, at the university, you know, working there? Um, so I loved it. I mean, I'm still an adjunct professor for a different university yeah. now. So I still like being involved with youth and sort of fostering growth in our industry. Um, in particular in the media space. So I, I loved it. I, I loved how much I learned, particularly around the concept of um, systematic patterns and generalizability and the, the reality of quality research. Like it changed everything for me. So, um, you know, it, you know, I had my moments. I, I don't particularly find universities very innovative, which is why I left. Okay. Um, universities don't like change, and our industry is the most dynamic, dynamic it's been in a lot, a lot of years. So put two and two together with that one. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it, I, I got frustrated with the lack of change or the desire for change or innovation. Um, but in terms of what I've learned there, it's invaluable to what we do now. And in terms of that kind of pace of change, do you feel that there's just a sense of, this is a strongly held belief that we have lots of evidence for over a lot of time and to go and find something that's against that. Well, see, what's interesting about it, it's not against it. What's interesting is um, the materials have changed, Yeah. right? So I'm going to tell a funny little story. So there are laws of architecture. My husband's an architect and there's this, this guy called Vitruvius who, you know, 500 years ago wrote this whole philosophy of an architect and it's based on the rules of physics. So, you know, there's, Christ knows what they're called, I can't remember, there's about six or seven different philosophies and laws. And all that's changed over the years is that all of a sudden you don't just use concrete, you can use fiberglass, right? But then the, the laws have to be adjusted to manage the adjustment in weather and, you know, the way that fiberglass moves versus concrete and all this sort of stuff. But what I look at is the same thing. So the laws are theoretically there in terms of how people consume, but what's changed is the ability for a the measurements change quite considerably so you have to look at that but also the types of platforms and how we interact with platforms now so the the user experience is training us to watch ads or not watch ads we don't have any control over your own attention you know we talk about that with teenagers you know how they're addicted to different socials and it's no different than the ad space so so my gripe with that kind of yeah. lack of innovation is the way that we get to these laws has evolved and it hasn't remained in concrete. It, now we're at fiberglass, you know. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, so there needs to be kind of the... It just evolution. has to be it evolved, yeah. Very brave to go out on your own. How, how terrifying was that? It depends on which day you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> how did I... What was the question? How, how terrifying was that kind of going out on your own? Well, it's funny because I, I never expected it to be what it is. I okay. Yeah, I, I went out, um, funnily enough, my first employee was my research um, supervisor. So my PhD supervisor, we were friends. And we were just going to do a bit of a, a consultancy um, because I could sense that there was something in this viewability. And I, I just thought, well, I'll you know, do some sort of consultancy work. But it, it just got deeper and deeper. And the technology that we were building, you know, got better and better. And so it kind of grew. Now we're a full product-led business in SaaS. So it, it's quite different now than what it was. So if you'd asked me at the time, will you have a business that kind of sells, you know, data for processing in planning, media and trading? Probably not. Right. <laughs> I might not have done it. With the staff of 40. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with yeah. the staff of 40. Um, um. Yeah. Well, listen, on to, you, look, we've touched on, obviously, attention. And, like, it is a complex and, as you say, kind of evolving topic. We just start without oversimplifying it. But, like, can we just get into what do we mean, what do we mean by attention? So, in some ways, it's funny you ask me that question because, in some ways, I regret even, because, you know, obviously, I called it that in the early days. Yeah. What, what I was frustrated about was this concept of engagement. So, reach was one thing, but then there was always this fluffy oh yeah, but people have to be engaged in the ads. Well, what the hell is that, right? So I, I remember thinking a more quantifiable word is attention, right? But even now I think that word unto itself is quite um, uh, controversial because a lot of people think that attention is cognitive rather than visual. Um, so. So, so in the sense of so in the sense of media um, measurement, the concept of attention is um, has and, and remember, there's visual and there's neuro, and we decided to do visual 
for the purposes of scale. Neuro is not scalable, right? So in our world, the concept of attention is, is someone looking at the ad? If so, for how long and how are they switching between attention and inattention? So we measure inattention as much as we measure attention. And then we connect those dots to outcomes and things like that. So for us, um, in most cases, it's through facial or facial detection, pose estimation, gaze estimation. So any computer vision models that, you know, through a camera, for example, like Zoom or something like that. Yeah, I, and sorry, because you're touching on something there that just the distinction between maybe attention and memory, like they're they're very distinct things and you're, you are all about the, the attention. We are, but we can tell. So we collect outcomes alongside of it. So because of the scale or the depth of the data we collect, um, you know, we collect attention data every five, one, five times a second across all of the different content that we film. So we can tell how people are switching, we can tell um, and how that is related to outcomes and things like that. So we've been able to then do a whole lot of stuff. Remember, this been, business has been seven years. Yeah. We've been able to look at memory decay across, because we've been in 17 or 18 countries with the gaze piece and 26 countries with all the rest of the attention data that we have. So we have a lot of data that can link how you're looking at something or how you're interacting with content and its relationship to outcomes, memory, um, just choice, random choice, things like that. And so there is, again, there is a connection between <coughs> attention and, and sales and, and those, those outcomes. Yep, there is, but um, it's not linear. So one thing that does frustrate me a lot in this, this world, because I'm going to tell you now, my agenda for this data is that it equalizes reach because at the end of the day that's the problem the problem we are solving for is that not all reach is equal so if you've got a metric or a measure i should say that sits over the top of that and makes all reach equal all the laws of brand growth will be whole again right um but uh what was the question <laughs> the attention sector oh, page memory link correlate yeah. stars um, so one I get is, well, does this even work? Like, is attention even valuable? The first thing I say is, we'll turn your advertising off and then I'll see you in a year. Yeah. <laughs> because if you don't think that's attention, then what is? Um, the second thing I say is, you know, what I can tell you is I can help you understand how much attention you're going to get on certain platforms, formats, etc. But at the end of the day, if you do a data ad, you're not going to get a sale. So I get frustrated with the... So we definitely see, obviously, correlations yeah. between, and more than correlations, proper regression, right, um, between um, someone looking at an ad and some sort of outcome, but it's not perfect. And it's not perfect because we only looked at some data yesterday where this really high-profile brand failed to put their logo on their ad. At all. So it was misattributed to another competitor, Double Jeopardy, right? So, you know, those are the sorts of things, you, it's not guaranteed. So creative has a, a big role to play in getting the sale. My job is to help you understand the effectiveness of different platforms and formats and to make it more efficient. And you did some work recently with, with Pepsi and there was interesting stuff there about kind of the, you know, bigger brands may not benefit from they benefit yeah look they benefit from active attention as well so let me just explain so active attention and this comes from all the early heath work you know so the way that we collect the data is we look at active attention which is are you looking straight at the ad we look at passive attention which is are you near the ad and non attention which is you're not your face is there's no way you could even anywhere be yeah. possibly looking at it or you've left the room so again i forgot the question well, I was asking about the work you've done with, with Pepsi about oh, size. So what we know is that there is value in both, right? You don't have to necessarily be looking straight at the ad to actually get some value from it. So this big piece of work we did with Pepsi was we looked at, because they've obviously got lots of different brands in their portfolio, we looked at brand size and the value of passive versus active. And what was interesting, every brand is valued, get, gets value from active attention, but, but big brands get more value from passive attention, right? Where, because as long as they've got distinctive assets, I mean, we're in the home of Heineken, which have wonderful distinctive yeah. assets. So in their case, you know, they can probably afford to be advertising in places where, 
it's not necessarily going to be right in their face because they do have distinctive assets. And so the, then the smaller brands, does that, do they need to have then tick all the boxes, right? Because like, this is hard if you're a smaller brand. It's very hard for a smaller brand. So you, you, there's a whole, so in this new book that I've written, I, there's a whole chapter around these sort of attention laws, which I'm calling it. So there's a whole... There's a whole lot of um, double jeopardies in there. So, so small brands suffer the most because they often are, I guess, ill-equipped to fund yeah. high attention media, but then they, if they don't get that, they're less likely to be noticed and more likely for their bigger competitor to be noticed. So it's it's tough, yeah. And they don't have the, or not yet, the distinctive brand assets. Well, that's right. Yeah. So their brand assets aren't, aren't, um, aren't strong. Just a point on that. What we do notice, though, is a lot of big brands are losing their fame around the distinctive assets because they're putting more emphasis on low attention platforms. So they're failing to train their youth. So there's a big problem, and I'm predicting that a lot of the distinctive assets that have been built over 100 years will, unless you have a process of training through storytelling or through longer formats, as well as the refreshment, you you are going to lose the fame around your distinctive assets. So they're they're banking on the the strength of the asset. Now. Correct, but they don't understand the fact that there's this viewership distribution, which basically means that most people aren't even seeing the distinctive assets on some of these formats. Wow. Okay. You, you talked a bit. Um, you talked before about like the fast decay and, and slow yes. slow decay. Just to put a line in the sand, the reason why not all reach is equal, which kind of makes sense, is the way that humans interact with different formats and different platforms, right? So classic case in point, if you think about a fast decay platform, what it means is lots of people, so you've got a 30 second ad, call it, lots of people are watching in second one and then you do everything you can to get away from it. So you have you know, 90% of the viewership that you've paid for looking and then majority of others scrolled away, skipped away, swiped away, thrown the phone away, whatever. They're just like, so there's this distribution that drops off really, really fast. If you think about a J, right? And that, that changes depending on the platform and the format, etc. But then there's a flat decay where you normally see um, people, the same amount of people watch at the front end, and it might only be 50% of the audience, but they also are watching at the back end. It's called flat decay. And the biggest difference for that is, well, firstly, that's why not all reach is equal, because that volume that's missing is, so, so if you put a million dollars on a fast decay platform and a million dollars or a million impressions on a slow decay platform, you get very, very vast differences in terms of how many people are watching, yet you're paying for the same impressions, right? So that's the problem. But the other thing with flat decay is you can actually put longer ads on and you will get more attention, whereas you can't with slow decay, a, a fast decay. And, and you touched it there with the brand that's not kind of not didn't have their brand or their logo anywhere through through the or ad. at least not till second, you know, twenty nine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so that's been around for I guess a while. You know that you know those moments where branding should be in you were you know you've got plenty of graphs and evidence around that. Why? Why are people still maybe missing that? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't get it. I think a lot of um, creatives are nervous that it's offensive um, to throw your brand in someone's face. But I'm telling you now, we can see when big brands are misattributed to competitors, it's not very fun. You might as well just give your money to someone else. So you've got a choice, be offensive <laughs> or just give your money to someone else. No, but, but if you are clever with your distinctive assets and do something in a fun kind of way, um, I think, you know, it, it, it's just, it's not like, you know, Lego. <laughs> yeah, because there was a period, and I know some of us have, have seen it and, and done it ourselves, where it was kind of like the, you know, the brand X story, you know, like literally the brand name story coming up at the front of the ad as a way to get the, the name of the brand up front. But it's more, or would you, you be, it's more about like really integrating the brand more fully into the, or do you think actually don't miss out on your logo on those first Look, seconds. if you've got a distinctive logo, you have to stick with that. But if I was going to choose, if I was going to build a brand from scratch, I would have assets that were perhaps a little bit less. This is my name, and yeah, I would probably choose a character or an ad style or a product shape or something color that is 
noticeable in a passive way as well, or even auditory, auditory, because, you know, so many times you're not looking, but, but you can hear it. I was going to ask you about the, the role of audio, because it's, you know, particularly probably with passive, that's where people might pick up the, that's, I'm hearing this, you know, probably. hundred percent. The problem is CMOs get sick of their assets and they change them out. Um, so I was only talking to someone yesterday about, um, you know, um, driver safety and how hard it is to get messages to people about slowing down or non-smoking and things like that. And I said, the best way you can do something is make your actual message a auditory asset. Like, I mean, you know, I'm not creative, but like slow down, slow down, slow down or something like that. And that's actually kind of recognised for their logo, as their logo almost, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we've touched a bit on creative. Can we talk a bit about the role of creative? Because, you know, if you get, if you get everything right, like, you know, fame, brilliant distinctive assets, it, it still doesn't mean you're guaranteed. So this is, this is the science behind it all. And the creatives don't like it, but the reality is, like I said, if you get the creative right, that is the single most important thing that will get you the sale. Attention won't get you the sale. So I hold you for that. But what people don't really understand, I get all the time is, well, if you build a good piece of creative, then you'll get more attention. That's not how it works because of these distributions. So step back. The reason why some platforms have more attention than others is literally because of the user experience. I often liken it to, if you think about when you go to the cinema, you are locked in, you're not supposed to use your phone, you're not supposed to talk to people, and the screen's like 400 million yeah. size, right? If you then go to an MFI site, it's like horrendous, horrendous and you just want to get out of it as quick as you can. So they're two very different types of ad experiences. And the way that you interact with that ad is directly related to those very, so that's one end of the scale to the other. So if you think about the spectrum right across all of the different um, formats and platforms, it's literally the user experience that defines how much attention you will pay. So what it means is the creative can nudge that, like can nudge it slightly, but we see systematic patterns that says, you've got a range, here, here's your opportunity on, on say for the MFA site, you'd be lucky if you get, if you get one second of time. So you've got to do wonders with creative in one second, because you can't change that, because people will want to skip out versus cinema, your opportunity is probably a good 30 seconds of time. So your creative might get 15 seconds because it's boring, or it might get 25 seconds because it's good. But we know this because we are able to intercept across all different formats, right? So the way our technology works is if you give us our, your ad, I can put your ad across TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, general web in real time. Yeah. And what we can see is that the same ad performs very, very differently across all these different user experiences. If creative was dominant, you would get the same amount of attention across all different formats, and we don't. We see systematic patterns. So creative is valuable, but it's tempered by the performance of the platform, which is the user experience. And that's it, just on the methodology. You're taking that same piece of creative, and it is across all. So it's like make our ads stick it on everywhere, which so we can often you know, do. So bearing in mind, I am actually a trained researcher. So the reality is you have to hold these variables constant if you want to understand influence, right? So a lot of the stuff that Nielsen did in the early days about creative being really valuable, they didn't, that it could be any number of things that, right. right? So they didn't hold one or the other constant. So you've got to hold the creative constant to understand how media works. Otherwise, it could be the creative that's driving it if you don't, you know what I mean? Yeah, so context, we so built yeah. it, when I first left the uni, I built it that way because I knew that it was basically building control groups. And then we've kind of done it ever since. But we do collect just naturally in the wild as well. But, I mean, it's been fascinating. So that's how I see all these patterns. And you talked about, like, some platforms you might get, like, one second. It does beg the question, what are we doing there? Look... Every platform has its role to play, right? So you just have to understand, you have to sort of think about what is it that this particular campaign is doing? Are we, are we telling people new information? Is it, is it just refreshment? Um, then you can work out how much attention you need. And if it's one second, 
but you're a Tiffany's and you've got a most beautiful blue box and it's yeah, just yeah. like, then done, good. And I don't, like, again, I often, I just often think about smaller brands that don't have the, they're not Tiffany's. And actually, a lot of the time where they're spending their money is on digital platforms where it's the job is probably from your work is kind of more about refreshing, but they've nothing to refresh. But then there's this double nuance there yeah. for them as well because the those digital formats are the ones that have the least volume. So that's where, you know, you might get 20% of the audience even looking at your ad than you think you are. So so it's it's real tough. So that have you ever seen the work that I've done with Peter Field on Share of Voice, Share of Market? So he talks about how the relationship has failed. So no more does Share of Voice, Share of Market. So if you don't know what that is, it means there was a relationship that said, however much you spend relative to the size of your brand is how much market share you'll gain or lose as a result. Right? There's a the relationship, but it doesn't work that way anymore because you can spend $10 million here and $10 million there. And because the volume of attention is so vastly different, it means nothing. So what happens with small brands is they don't have $10 million, but they might have a million dollars and they'll spend it on low attention and often low CPM thinking they're getting lots of reach, but it's actually a false economy. CPM. So, yeah. Oh, yes. Cost per meaningless thousand. That's what I call it. Yeah, I call it cost per meaningless thousand. Um, and the reason why it is, if that's what you were going to ask gonna me, ask, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is because um, it makes sense to think, oh, we'll just do an attention CPM and it will work. But the reality is, so, so metrics are made up of two measures usually or more. And in the case of cost per thousand, it's cost and reach, right? So the problem we have with well, reach is broken, but the other problem is cost is based on a biddable world. So it used to be that cost per thousand meant in the olden days when I was younger, um, it was actually like in, in kind of traditional media, it was about how many newspapers were sold, right? Or I mean, I don't know I'm that old, sorry. But, um, but now, through particularly the bidding infrastructure in the last 20 years, you pay what you think you should pay to get that spot because you think it's valuable. So there's no relativity around cost anymore. So my point with cost per meaningless thousand is that not only is it that you're not getting a thousand people, but the cost you're paying has no relative value to the thousand that isn't actually real either. So it's a real problem for our industry. So I'm very anti-attention CPM because I call it a dirty variable, which is basically, or dirty code, which um, basically dirty code means you've got this piece of software, but there's one line of code that completely screws it up and then it doesn't work. And that's what I call CPM or attention CPM. Because attention's really pure, but cost per thousand just doesn't work. Because there's just too many. No. So, Implications of all this, and I, I want to talk. I do want to ask you about the um, kind of some of the, the platforms, and I know you've done some research here, but also in, in Australia. But while we're on kind of measurement and 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 buying, like what has what has to change? What has to change is what is changing right now, and that is there's a, we're in amongst a perfect storm, and I picked it. This is why I left the uni. Um, there's three things happening at the moment. The obvious one is the cookie depletion of privacy. That's the obvious. So everything, everyone is gearing up for change because mentally it has to. There's also a rally cry around quality um, measurement and quality data. So, you know, when in the early days when there was a rally cry for some sort of viewability metric, it eventually came in. When there's a rally cry for brand safety, you know, there's a thing. Then it was sustainability and it's definitely around data quality. So that's the second piece. And then there's technological advancement as well. So um, when viewability was built, it was only really, I happen to know the founder of that business and um, he said that he wanted it to be an attention business but the technology wasn't advanced like it is now. So now we can intercept cameras with permissions to be able to actually then feed that footage back through machine learning models so it's very much more advanced than it was 20 years ago. So those three things are causing a perfect storm in our industry to allow us to be able to use the technology knowing that cookies are going to be depleted, so we have to build new measurement, 
to answer the question around data quality. Um, so what's changing is the industry are facing the biggest change that they have in 20 years and everyone's on board. Which is, you kind of said, sorry, you didn't, seven years ago, you couldn't have seen that coming. Or I knew you? that the Met, so the, where I started, I didn't know much about the cookies at the time. I did not know that was going to change and I didn't know much. But what I did know is that when you go from, when you have two currencies operating, one is basically the way that traditional reach is measured and one is the way that digital reach is measured is different. There was, there was going to be a crash at some point. So I knew that in the early days, but I didn't know all about how, you know, eventually, you know, the cookies would add to this perfect storm. And, you know, now you've the likes of, I was reading the, you know, the media strategy for PepsiCo saying we're determined to break free from traditional digital media measurement. I mean, I guess when you have the likes of the big players out there saying this, it's, it's incredibly helpful and it's moving the whole industry on. Yeah, and I think this is the value of the type of measurement that we build. There's a few of us that do it because it's not a metric which is spurious. It is measurement of humans that then informs ecosystem or planning systems and things like that. So it's designed to improve the quality of what your currency already is, which is reach. So attention is not going to be a currency. Attention is a measurement that supplements reach, which is your currency, that doesn't quite tell you what it needs to tell you. And you talked there just about there's a few that, that do this. Today's show is brought to you by the IndieList CMO Collective. This service from the IndieList provides you with access to a curated range of highly experienced and talented senior marketing specialists. Visit the IndieList.ie to find out more. You talked a bit about the ecosystem because there's more and more people that seem to be entering the yeah. attention space. Which is good and bad at the same thing. Okay. I mean, I actually predicted in my first book that there would be a flurry of this once this ecosystem started to land. So if you think about how attention measurement works, there's, if you put, again, put a line in the sand to make your life easy, there's those that measure humans and those that don't, full stop. So if anyone knows anything about machine learning, the way that this side do it, and this is how we made a choice to do it, you're collecting human footage and you're using that footage, because humans are complex, but you're using humans to basically predict with um, digital factors how you will behave in the future. Because we know exactly how you're gonna behave because of the nature of the user experience, right? So, so human-based collections with augmented tags is one side. So that's a combination of what I just said before, which is outward facing, which is the human, and inward facing, which is the device. Because at the end of the day, you can't be surveilling the entire globe because that's kind of not appropriate. <laughs> so, you know, our data set, I think it's 200,000 people, yeah. not small, but it's still not big enough to be a global sample. So you need to supplement that with tags, right? The other side is that they are basically advanced viewability. So think of it in advanced viewability where they use a few extra factors, but they don't understand the weighting that is relative to how humans interact. So they make the assumption that scroll speed, slow scroll speed means someone's looking. Sometimes it's not that. Sometimes you're scrolling slow because I'm talking to you and I don't want my phone to go dark. You know, so it just depends. So yeah, non-human, implied advanced viewability, human informed using tags for scale. Is the, I guess is the is the non-human risk is it a risk to the you know to attention as kind of a measure? It's very different. I mean look, I, I'm proud of the fact that this ecosystem has landed. We needed some sort of change. What makes me nervous is that the problem on this side is sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Right. That's the reality of it. And so what I'm nervous about is if we have a flood of vendors that have some sort of binary probability, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, then they're going to go, well, this attention thing's pretty crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I said I wanted to many, or talk about some of the, you know, I guess platforms maybe, but you were, you were here, you did some work with Tam Ireland and Red Sea um, about Irish TV viewing and, and attention. And, and effectively, we win. Is, is, is don't we we're the, we're the world's number one when it comes to attention <laughs> TV that's what I took out of yesterday <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean look um, 
Someone did ask you where we ranked as a country. We, we, we collected this data in high season, right? And what I've learned is you love your sport. I mean, Australians do too, but I think you're obsessive. And um, so, but the, the BVOD piece for me is off the charts. So I don't know if you call it CTV or BVOD, VOD, whatever you call it. It's, I mean, that, for me, that's the future of where TV's going. The digital TV space is so exciting because the amount of attention and how it can be predicted and how you can buy it programmatically exceptionally exciting so yes 100 percent. so it's probably some of the highest we've seen in in the world and i think it's because of the nature of the programming that sat behind that month that we were here so good programming means so the more attention you pay to the to the program and the more you love the program the more attention you'll pay to the ads because you don't want to miss it so yeah and there was um you did mention yesterday as well about kind of placements in programming as well as being a yeah. really great way to yeah we didn't do that for this yeah. one but we've we've done it many times before so because the way that we um we film people with permissions um you said that saying, <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, people worry about biometrics, right? Because biometrics is like, oh my God, you're what? You're filming people? Um, but what you should understand is we do it what we call on the edge. So basically that means the footage goes into this tiny little remote box that we send people. It's processed there. We discard your footage and we get the zeros and ones. So it's very ethically appropriate. And we get your permission to do it. And we pay people for their time. So there's a value exchange. What were you request asking me? <laughs> I forgot my question. I can't remember my question. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone would think I've had like 10 Heinekens yeah. already. Cheers, with zero zeros. Yeah. Yeah. Good for breakfast. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, so what I've done in the past is because we're basically collecting data, not just at the ad point, but also through the programming, um, we can actually timestamp sponsorships, right? And We've done this work before and it's huge. So in program advertising in whatever form it might look like, whether it's obvious or whether there's a strategically placed Heineken <laughs> behind you, it's, it's game changing because that's where the most attention is paid. Um, so what I will say though, is that what I do is I understand the value of attention, but then there's a reach and a cost component that you have to consider as marketers and media owners or media buyers, because there's no point in me getting you a huge amount of attention, but five people yeah. were exposed, right? So that's the job for your optimizers. Uh, you've also done a bit of work in Australia with is it QMS on, on out of home. Yes. Has that come out yet? Are you able to tell us a bit about that? So I can and can't. Um, <laughs> we've done a couple of things with them. So Outdoor's amazing. Um, I do love Outdoor. I do, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. Oh, Where is he? <laughs> Jeff has not oh, paid for this. I just yeah. like to say, <laughs> Jeff has sponsored uh, this. This is um, <laughs> so um, the. Uh, it's interesting because we started with street furniture, which is easy to collect because you just put little cameras, ethically collected cameras, <laughs> on based. outdoor, right? <laughs> um, but it's interesting because outdoor is very different because you know we're filmed 24 7 anyway as soon as you walk down the street with ctv cameras everywhere but we've actually then worked with qms on massive billboards like massive ones on bridges and on um, buildings and things like that and it's super super interesting so where the billboard is determines how much advertise uh, how much attention you pay because again it's about the user experience so if you're like sort of zooming past in your car on a highway, probably less likely to sort of be looking. Yeah. Um, but if your if your billboard is out the front of a train station and you know and you're and there's this big set of lights and there's this whole big amount of people just standing there, what are you going to look at? Well, you're probably not going to look at him, so you probably just look here. Yeah. And so we see. So that's what I mean by the user experience determines how much attention you pay because it defines where you look. Um. I want, we will come to questions if people have questions. So do do think about questions I might have for Karen. But there, you you've said yourself there has been criticism of of the work. I think you said you know I've been labelled a naysayer, attention seeker, narrow minded. How do you deal with that? Or do you have just, I? Well, you, this you've quoted. I quoted from you. Did I? Uh, yeah. Um, 
so how would quit the criticism and you know they're handsome do you, do you just ignore him or do you oh or, him <laughs> <laughs> okay do we know who we're talking about here everyone yes uh, him is concerned because his book was so while ago and it's changed right yeah. so the problem we have is that Again, he doesn't like that because I'm not suggesting that what they've done is wrong. I'm suggesting they need to do some new work when they understand across the mm -hmm. digital ecosystem to try and see if the laws still hold. So, look, it doesn't bother me because, you know, if you all actually know who we're talking about, if you haven't been bashed or bullied by that man, then you're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd go on Twitter or something. Oh, like that. Got on film saying that I'm too. Next. I was about to get like bullied and bashed again. And <laughs> um, you've mentioned a book, the, oh, thir yes. the third in your series of I nine. I have. I just spent three months locked away in my office with snakes, and uh, <laughs> hence why the cat was very happy to get my attention with that thing. Um, yeah, just finished it a few weeks ago, so it's already gone to publisher. And so this one is the last one I'm ever going to write because I'm over it. <laughs> um, but it's the it's a, it's the sequel to the Attention Economy, but it's called a Category Blueprint. I am super proud of this one; it's twice the size of it. But this one talks about all the pieces of work we've done in the last sort of four years since the first one, and how much work we've done around all these things we've just spoken about, and what the patterns are. It is literally a blueprint to how you how you plan media and, and what you do. And then there's all this work in there about future with Gen AI and creative and how creative fits in. And then there's a whole chapter on ethics. Worked with the team that, from the UN and you know just oh. to understand the value exchange in an attention economy. So yeah, I, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it to be honest. And it comes out in the or it's out. No, the, summer. I, I actually, funnily enough, saw this morning that it's pre-sale, but we're going to do a launch in Cannes. But some people have tried to say, well, while you're in France, you know, why don't you pop back here? So I might come back and do a launch here too. Brilliant. Well, I will more Hold than happy to, to that. <laughs> you have to, keep, you yeah. have to keep emailing me. And I'll have to ask the lawyers to stop yeah. stopping your <laughs> stopping your emails. You know, I mean, Jenny Romaniak did her world exclusive book launch on my podcast she had no idea that's what it was ah, but i called it that go. so you, you're more than welcome right. to do yours <laughs> here with me um i gotta ask we'll actually go to questions in a second but like so much going on how and what do you do to just chill out so not much <laughs> so these do you want some random stuff yeah so two things we live on the beach a lot of australians do I love supping. Do you know what supping is? Stand up paddling. Oh my god, I'm so good at it. Beer, I will never <laughs> fall in. I don't fall in, so I can sup for a long time. So my husband has to help me take the thing down to the water and pop me in there, and then come see me over the edge. And oh, she's ready, so she comes and gets me. But um, so supping is a thing, and in the summer there, it's just stupid, beautiful, glassy water. And the other thing, random, is I'm a sewer. Oh. Now, I don't sew for myself, but um, occasionally I'll get some cushions going or at the moment I'm doing like this little linen skirt, which is just, I don't know why the hell. I, my mum taught me that when I was 16 and it's just this cathartic thing that takes me away but keeps my mind going because I can't just relax. Okay. I have to do something while I'm trying to relax. So you're not sitting there and just watching telly? Oh, I'm, oh I shouldn't say that. No. <laughs> I'm not a big TV watcher, to be honest. I'm a CTV watcher. Okay. I'm a, I'm a go to what I want to watch when I want to watch it. Yeah. Um, so, do think about QA. I, I did ask for questions um, and I got a great question from, um, from Twitter X. Are you, are you scared? Oh my God, did you actually? Yeah, I did. Are you ready for it? So, it's from the controversial Giles Edwards and Ryan Waldman. And they want to know what you think about their name of their new book, How Brands Blow. So I've just profiled them in my book. <laughs> so I love it so much. So I've got their book and I've actually done a piece highlighting. So when did they ask you that? Yesterday. Oh my God, yeah. they're so naughty. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're amazing. The book is hilarious. So, yeah. and it's particularly distinctive. Um, but it was, it was an interesting one because it was, some of it's serious and some of it's not serious, yeah. but it mm, blended. I couldn't quite tell. So they're pretty <laughs> clever, sarcastic, funny guys. So there was some, and I think Australian humour and Irish humour is kind of similar, yeah. where you kind of go, were you just 
taken the piss or not? <laughs> Um, so it was funny. It was really good. Yeah, yeah it's a, it is. A, it is a great book. But it makes sense. So they've they've kind of basically talked about the basics of marketing, but in a really funny, creative way. I'm not a creative person, so I loved it. But um, yeah, it's a good one. I, I actually think it should be every like student of marketing should read that book just to just to get their head. So they need how brands grow, how brands blow, the attention economy. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's, that's the curriculum. <laughs> You're listening to That's What I Call Marketing live with Karen Nelson-Field. Stay tuned. We are now going to have our live Q&A session with the audience. Um, I'd love to see if we've got questions from the audience. We might swap mics, Karen, and I'll walk around to this one. So I'll hand you this. Um, Oh, Paul has a question. Do you need a radiator? Are you okay? (laughs) Hi, Karen. Let's just say who you are so everyone knows. So, Paul Durbin. So, um, Karen, I have a question uh, which I may not articulate very well, but and there may not be an answer. In terms of you know the Ross at Reed policy, where where people who are customers tend, in, in surveys tend to notice their advertising more than those who don't. So, the reality is, what you're saying to me is that if you're an existing buyer, you tend to notice more. Yeah. 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 It, does that have an impact on any of your data? So, does so that, does that make sense? it does make sense. And it's interesting you asked me that because originally we were collecting for previous usage to understand that. But the samples are so large that it's random anyway. So we get enough non-users and users in the samples for the overall um, patterns to be the same. Um, but we do we do notice differences between buyers and non or existing users and non-users. Um, but it's not as significant as you think. And it's likely because, again, if you're sort of thrown an ad while you're watching something on YouTube, you can't not look at it, even if you're a non-buyer or a buyer. Do you know what I mean? But we we started collecting those distributions of heavy light and non-buyers right at the beginning for years, but we don't now because the samples are always evenly distributed. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Colin Lewis. Um, it is more a philosophical question than anything else. Oh, good lord. But, yeah, <laughs> don't worry, it's not too heavy. Uh, you know, all we hear from the uh, certain acolytes out there is broad reach, broad reach, broad reach. And um, I've been one of the people who's got a question um, and had the temerity to question what does that actually mean and been, you know, bullied in vertical comments online. And, <laughs> Why, I think we should start a club. <laughs> why on earth are people trapped in this worldview that is looking backwards and not accepting the fact that we have all these different channels with you know lots of different things going on, these incredible user experiences which are sort of trapping us in their domain, and yet all the, the things that everybody follows appear to be looking backwards and not looking forward. So again, it's a little philosophical. Why is this? I understand exactly why. And that is because they don't understand the pipes behind measurement in the digital world. That's as simple as it is. So they don't they don't have a strong enough understanding of media and how media pipes and programmatic works to be able to explain how it fits with their philosophy. Simple as that. So for them um, yeah, I mean, that's that's probably all I'll say. But it, so, so we've had this conversation, like they don't want their laws to break because that's their unique offering. But if they did have a stronger understanding of media planning, buying, bidding, programmatic, measurement, marketplaces, DSPs, SSPs, all the other Ps, then I think they probably would have a different philosophy. And uh, Sorry, without getting into your IP, um, we have a fascination with audio in this country. Oh. Do you, how do you program or how do you research the audio consumption when like your models that are on visual, do you do audio? So we've had Spotify as a customer for many years. So I'm just trying to work out what I can tell you. <laughs> Sorry. So we've so basically we we've we've got so much data that under we, we 
it's not perfect, but we understand what outcomes you would expect in a generalized way and how much attention that might bring you. It's not perfect. So there'd be a lot of standard deviation around that, right? So when we started with Spotify, basically what we did, and we've done it multiple, multiple countries. We've just done another big study in India where we work with them and they collect um, surveys from thousands and thousands of people using the discrete choice methods that we use. We collect all of that data. We, they also tell us, um, and sometimes they use our technology, sometimes we use theirs, where we can tell if the headphones are in, the volume and things like that. And we've been able to make predictions in a broad sense around how would it, you know, how much are people processing and what would that mean in an active attention way. More recently, and I won't tell you the results because that hasn't been launched, but I have been to market and publicly said, we've recently activated the cameras. So I know you go, well, what, what does that even mean? Because on Spotify, you're not watching, but you do. So when you're changing playlists and when they, there's video ads on, Sp on Spotify now. So we, in the next round, and we've done it and I've got the results, but I can't tell you about them, but we are now moving to audio but understanding how people are interacting in that way. So the other things we can tell is when someone's got headphones on, how much more valuable that experience is than in a passive kind of background way. So yeah, we, we're kind of evolving, but they've been amazing partners. But audio is very valuable. Hi, Karen. I'm Chloe Nanradi and Mary Master. Fine girl, thank you so much. Um, what advice would you give brands who are currently using data from media owners like YouTube and Meta to inform their strategies? Do I, yeah, I'm so much trouble. Um, I think get them in trouble. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start with this. Time and view is the principal most important metric that they will send you without being, they're not falsifying anything, but they use time and view as the principal metric of strength, right? The time and view relationship to attention is one in three, and that's on the best day. So if you have 10 seconds of time and view, you'd be lucky if one in three people actually get to that. So you think about that error, that 70% error with time and view. So my point is, when you have data from anyone, anyone where, and this is, you know, I asked, and I said that really quietly, but it's being filmed anyway. I asked to verify anyone that's giving you data which their principal methodology relies on time and view as the critical variable of engagement, it's wrong. Not because they're being naughty, but they don't understand the relationship between attention and time and view. Okay, thank you. That was very well said, Karen Nelson. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Um, I, I think you made a very important distinction in attention between cognitive and visual. But do you ever worry uh, by the nature of observe, by seeking permission and telling somebody you're observing their behavior, you're inherently changing the behavior? So when you're on Zoom, do you act differently? Or do you actually just like, you have, you've been doing it now for like four years, right? And pretty much you just sort of turn up and do your meeting and off you go and you have normal, you're not like sitting there fully groomed and like, oh my God, perfect. And I'm more attentive than ever because I'm being filmed. I mean, all that data through Zoom goes back to their machine learning models. I mean, look, the answer is we don't tell them what we're doing in that we don't tell them we want to film you to understand if you like ads or not. We, when we ask people to be um, part of survey groups, we'll say, um, and, and there's two things. We'll say we want to help the user experience of the different platforms and things like that. So it's more understanding the value exchange between the viewer and the platform. Um, but also if there was an issue, so, so what you should know is that there, I'm not learning a lot of new stuff now. There's so much there's systematic sameness across every single, and I know exactly what to expect whenever I go to market. If that made a difference, we wouldn't see such consistency across the data. Um, but also the other thing we do is we rarely do ongoing longitudinal panels. 
we yeah. often yeah. dip in and dip out because the way that our tech works is we can recruit off of a programmatic exchange and we can go to India tomorrow or we can go to you know Portugal tomorrow or we can come to this country tomorrow because we can recruit 3,000 people randomly. So it's, it's not like we've trained people that that's what they're in a survey group to do either. So we've done a whole lot of so research bias is an area of specialty of mine, so we've done a whole lot of checks and balances around exactly that. But what we find is really people don't really operate any differently. The only country that is different, I'll be honest with you, are like Saudi where they have issue with facial. So we had to change our technology to allow for burqas and things like that because they are very concerned about people looking at their face. Happy Friday. Um, I suppose in the seven years that you've been in business, you've literally witnessed everything from a pandemic to mass layoffs to wars. So um, I, I suppose, does your technology take into the macro environment and kind of predict what a mass negative news event could have uh, on attention and kind of what the, the, the timeline for recovery is? <laughs> <laughs> So can I predict whether the economy is going to improve from a? <laughs> or if, if, if there's if there's like a, a, a mass like say like there's more mass, uh, I suppose if there's more mass uh, layoffs or if there's uh, a war or, or, or an economic crisis, what that does to attention yeah. and then the timeline for recovery. Yeah. So the timeline for recovery, I couldn't answer, right? But what I do know is there through the pandemic there was a period when we stopped collecting data through the height of it because. Firstly, my first book was about emotions diffusion, uh, sorry, uh, content diffusion and how emotions play a role in sharing of content. And basically, even from back then, I understand that high arousal content changes the way that you stare at something or the way you share information in this case. And negativity is equally as impactful as positivity. So you can tell, like, for example, if, if, if your entire Facebook feed was filled with real information about something and it was about a pandemic or it was about you probably would actually that your user experience would change but we haven't seen it for any of like the wars or anything like that it's just that that was one period of the pandemic where it was a little bit different but I couldn't help I couldn't explain how like it was a fairly fleeting moment because once the news is once you become um, what's the word, like acclimatised to the reality of what we went through, you kind of go, oh yeah, 20,000 people infected, oh, yeah. You know, whereas at the beginning it was like, oh my God, let's check the news, how many people infected. So I think it was pretty fleeting. I mean, that was, that was a pretty crazy time. But layoffs, not so much. We don't see any changes in that. No. What does change, the data that we have, is when... Um, is when one of the platforms makes change in their user experience. So the minute they automatically put audio up or on, like they, instead of it being audio off by default, the minute they change the ad size, the minute they change where it is on and how it, it, it loads, it changes the way that you pay attention. Fortunately for us, our, what happens is our code breaks, so we have to adjust for that. So we're constantly collecting the correct, the updated version, and then it goes into the models from there. So that's pretty much the only thing that will change your behavior is if they change the formats. And does it increase the Beg your pardon? The Not always. Okay. They think it does. Yeah. So what's funny <laughs> about that is they think that putting an ad straight in your face, a full screen, will drive attention. And a lot of these models on this side make that assumption, but it's not often. Karen, so it's Paul Darwin again. <laughs> <laughs> so th this this data from from your first book and then your second book just makes it very uh, frustrating for us to make ads because um, so, so wow so, so you you did stuff with Orlando as well from System One and and a lot of System One uh, research and and Red Sea and everything else would show that if you can build emotion. Into your into your kind of advertising creative, 
it's got a better chance of being effective. But then we also know from a lot of your work that like a lot of ads are viewed on mute and it's a very short period and you've got to get your brand in there. Early. It's really hard. Yeah, so the recent work that I did with Orlando, because we've presented twice at Cannes the last, they're so much fun. So Orlando, Peter Field, and this last year we did, um, it was Rob Britton as well. So this last year, oh God, you know that's only like a few months away, I'm almost, <laughs> and then it's Christmas. Um, um, but last year we, we tested, so, so System 1 tested, um, I don't know, 50 Effie's ads. We actually ran through our system as well to collect how much tension they had. And what we found, and this was, poor Orlando needed, you know, some time to breathe for this one. But he, what we, what we kind of worked out was that you're right, but how sort of emotional content is tempered by the performance of the platform again. So classic case in point is you can have a really high emotion. And remember, my first book was emotion. So of all people, I get it. So you can have a really high emotional piece of content, but if you put it on a low performing platform, the upside of high emotions to low emotions is tiny. But you put that same piece of creative, let's just call it a cinema ad again, because yeah. I'm trying to do extremes, that the difference between low emotion and high emotion is vast in terms of how much attention you get. So the emotion amplifies the opportunity, but it can't if you're going like that with the scrolling, you know, like it, it's tempered by that performance. And this is the point because the, to, to uh, for a lot of good work to create emotion, it needs time. Like, it, you know, Correct. it needs pause, Story it time, needs all right? that stuff. hundred percent. So just from, in terms of asking for your advice on this, so a lot of advertising media plans have gone towards shorter format digital. And, and in terms of guidance to people, they can spend a lot of time working how to build emotional You're not going to build emotions in yeah, six seconds. So it's, it is, like I said, it's... It's pretty hard. Yeah, it is. The, you know? yeah. <laughs> I will say, um, mark this space, but where I think that changes is things like AR. Yeah. Because cause you're involved in it. That's mm. So a short period of time when you're part of the star yeah. and you are think about something like Snap. Will the formats get better though for, for I guess, these platforms? You know, like, as in like, the size of the form of the ad, the, if they can slow down the scroll and these things? Can't answer that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, more US, UK sort of focus question. So Amazon advertising has now become a very big mm. kind of uh, channel, if you will. Um, you know, like many of them, they could be accused of marketing their own homework. How do you plug newer kind of channels, particularly this one here, which is so powerful and also within, but well, for the most part, within a, a, you know, a wall garden? How are you kind of tapping into that? Sort of we research? don't need their permission to collect data. So how it works yeah. is when we have a panel of wonderful people that are happy for us to do this work, um, by giving me permission through our app, you give me permission to your Facebook feed. So we, there's this interesting little loophole. Um, so if, yeah, so I can intercept any, like Pinterest, whatever you give me permission to do, I can do it. So the same with these channels. So if I put a panel of people with these Android boxes in their home, we can actually dial into what they're watching and they, we don't need permission from any of those streaming services. So even if I'm watching, say, Amazon TV, whatever they call it, Prime, you, you're getting that data? Correct. So we just have an ACR process that allows us to be able to sort of connect the dots with the, the ad and what's in the home. We probably have time for one more question, if there's a, a question. Yeah, we do. Here we go. There you go. Hey Karen, uh, Owen Murphy. You mentioned that it's tough for smaller brands um, or a brand that may be smaller in a given market. Um, what's your one piece of advice for a brand that may be smaller in a given market? Oh, all right, okay. Um, so my one piece of advice is there are these mid-level video digital that's not super expensive that actually is a good happy medium. Stay away from the long tail. 
I get the high arousal, big screen stuff might be too expensive. There's this whole layer of middle that is really valuable. And they'll also, and some of them are flat decay, so they'll give you a lot more time if you put longer ads on. So just stepping back to that, which we kind of talked about. So with a, with a slow, with a fast decay platform, if you put a 10 second ad on, you'll only get five seconds. If you put a 20 second ad on, you'll only get five seconds. If you put a 30 second ad on, you'll only get five seconds, right? With a slow decay, 10 seconds, five seconds, 20 second ad, 10 seconds of attention, 30 seconds ad, 15 seconds of attention. So you can actually build out storytelling by default just putting on longer ads on some of these mid-level digitals. Um, that's what I would do if I was to run a business trying to grow assets. Do we have one more question? Are we, no, okay. Oh, Charlie, there we go, hang on. Thank you. Hi, Karen, Geraldine O'Neill, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, I have a question around B2B versus B2C and your experience of how both are looking at things right now from a measurement perspective. Just any thoughts on that? Yeah, we don't do, I mean, obviously my business does B2B, um, so we apply the same principles as we learn in terms of how we advertise B2B, but we don't have attention data on that because it's our own advertising money that we use. So most of our actual research or collection is done in a B2C way. So I can't really, other than we, like I said, we naturally know. So, so I think that the, the point is, use the same principles as B to C in a B to B format. Like them, there are certain platforms that can target the user group that you need, make sure that it's high um, exposure, um, you know, uh, kind of what we were saying before. So mid-level video, good quality video, things like that, but then in a, in a more targeted way. We don't do anything with things like emails or, you know, messages or anything like that. It's largely socials, web, uh, linked, we haven't, we're just about to, but Pinterest, you know, that sort of stuff. I don't know if that helped because it's not really my space. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Karen, thank you so, so much. So much fun. Yeah. You're <laughs> Really appreciate you. you taking the time out to Pleasure. join us today. It was absolutely really enjoyable, insightful as always. Uh, can't wait for the third book to come out. You heard it here first. Karen is going to launch her book, oh and that's what God, I call marketing. So <laughs> Thanks for that commitment. Um, <laughs> and to all of you for joining today in person, listening, watching, thanks a million for joining us on That's What I Call Marketing. Until the next episode, I'm your host, Connor Byrne. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks a million. Thanks to the Indie List for sponsoring today's show. Visit theindielist.ie to find out more. Special thanks to Heineck and Ireland for hosting this live event. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities.